Our next speaker session, ladies and gentlemen, uh, he's going to be sharing more about what does it take to make e-commerce profitable. So we have with us Mr. Ashish Hemrajani, who's the CEO and co-founder of Big Tree Entertainment a Private Limited, which operates Book My Show, which is India's largest online entertainment ticketing platform, offering tickets for movies, plays, concerts, sports, games, and live events. So if I may please invite uh, our next speaker, Ashish Hemrajani, to please come on the stage. All right, so can we have a nice, happy round of applause there for our next speaker as well, Ashish Hemrajani. No, no, I, no, I don't have a presentation, thank you. I usually dress to work like that, and usually for conferences I wear jeans, but today was an official reason to do this. But uh, thank you for having me over. Thanks, Vic. Thanks, Sam. Uh, what does it take to make e-commerce profitable? Why is it even a question? I just think uh, less stupid guys running it, I guess. I, I, I don't have an answer for that. Isn't it the purpose of any enterprise to take value from society, create value for themselves, and give something back and make a little profit in between? But I guess uh, those 101 lessons are things that most e-commerce companies in India have sort of forgotten. So what I'm going to try and do, it's a 20-minute session. I will try and make it as anecdotal and talk about the Book My Show journey and some of the lessons that we've learned, some harsh, some pleasant, some not so nice, some brilliant. And maybe you can pick up some sort of things that you can take back home. So uh, I founded Book My Show uh, about 19 years ago. Lesson one, that businesses aren't built uh, as sprints, but they are built in marathons. Uh, we've been around for close to 20 years. And most internet entrepreneurs today or e-commerce companies think that they, they start thinking like investors. Uh, that they want to start a company to exit so that they can make money. I don't think uh, you guys built Madison or all these companies to exit. I mean, you exit when you exit, or when you retire or make some money, but you build a business to solve a problem. And uh, most internet entrepreneurs today start a business because they're saying, jaldi paisa banega, but that's, that's, then you should be in the stock market, or, or not. So Book My Show started in 1999, and... Uh, I'm an ex-advertising guy. I worked for J. Walter Thompson for two years. And uh, Book My Show started because of smoking and drinking. Uh, I don't smoke, uh, but most folks around me smoked. It was a carpeted office. ITC was, uh, was the brand uh, that J. Walter Thompson handled. It was like the Mad Men days of 97 to 99. And uh, there was a lot of secondary smoke. And I wanted to clear my head metaphorically and physically. So I went for a holiday to South Africa, Zimbabwe, and Botswana, backpacked. And I read Stellenbosch, which is like the Napa of, of, of South Africa. And they give you free wine. And uh, I come from a land of scarcity, uh, where normally you give a cutting chai to an Indian, suddenly you give a red wine, everybody's looking at the viscosity, smelling it, spitting it. And I'm a Sindhi, I'm not spitting anything free. So I kept drinking from 11 in the morning to about 3 in the afternoon. And I was so smashed, I would sent a text message to my boss saying I'm quitting. Uh, she had said, OK, by the time I woke up the next morning. And here I am running a business for the next 19 years. I got invested by Chase Capital Partners, JP Morgan, in 1999. And in 2000, we were invest 2001, we were invested by News Corp. So if you, some of you would probably remember that the ecosystem in India didn't exist in 1999. Uh, internet penetration, mobile penetration, there wasn't a single number policy. Uh, you didn't have... Uh, credit card penetration, net banking, debit card. So the beauty of the internet business is that as your cost curve flattens, your revenue curve keeps growing up. And that's why the valuations are so high. Because at some point, your cost curve has to sort of flatten. Most other businesses, your input cost or your cogs keep going up as your revenue curve keeps going up. But that wasn't happening for us in those early days. And the reason was that even though we had a website, 98% of our bookings actually came from the call center. So we were, in effect, running a call center company. And because you didn't have a single number, you had seven cities where we ran a call center. We were the first company in the world which did home delivery of tickets on cash. And the other thing was that we would buy inventory. So on the weekend, we would have an opportunity loss. On the weekday, we had an actual loss because nobody wanted to buy tickets. And every time uh, you know, more people would call us, we would have more people to service those guys. 
And so our revenue curve went up and our cost curve kept going up again and again. The other problem was that we were running seven separate call centers in separate, seven separate cities. And therefore our marketing for those seven call centers was separate. And therefore again the cost went up, it wasn't efficient. And the other challenge was that every time uh, you know, we would sell out our inventory, you would have people still calling you. So let's say for example there's a big movie like Padmavat, people would call you and instead of having 100 people to service those calls, now you would have 1,000 people because you didn't want your NPS to dip, your net promoter score. So every time you'd still want to pick up the phone and say, I don't have any tickets available. So the, the cost curve and the revenue curve started going haywire. And then you know the famous, infamous dot-com bust, which started in the US in the 2000, it hit India in 2002. Book My Show went from 150 people down to six, including an office boy. We were wiped out. So I had uh, uh, six people that I continued with, and I had to look those guys in the eye. All the guys that followed me as an entrepreneur, they left their jobs. I had to take them to Shivaji Park. I didn't have money to take them to a conference room like that and tell them, hey, listen, the dream is over. But I negotiated a very hard deal to get them a six-month severance. Also sat down and parked my life for six months to try and place all of them. 50 or 60 of them got jobs in various entertainment businesses. And as karma and luck would have it today, all of them are at vice president positions giving business back to us. Second lesson in life I learned that always be good to people and karma always pays you back. Then from 2002 to 2007, we actually were in the road building or the pipe laying business. All we did was install ticketing software, change the rules of the game, uh, service uh, call centers, service the back end of most cinemas, uh, cricket, sports. Uh, and the idea was born out of solving a problem. And a lot of e-commerce companies today don't do that. They're not trying to solve a consumer problem. Let me go back to 1999. When I heard a rugby commercial trying to sell rugby, uh, a radio commercial trying to sell rugby tickets in South Africa, I said it's so simple. Because at that time in India, if you recall, you went to Sterling, Regal, and Eros, you had pigeonholes. You had pink tickets and blue tickets and yellow tickets. You had advanced counters and you had current counters. Within advanced and current, you had dress circle, balcony, and stall. Some of you may remember that. Today, all of that is gone. And so there were timings. So there was an arbitrage, of pri there was an arbitrage in, uh, in pricing. You didn't know if there were seats available. There was no democratization of information. And they would say tickets are sold out, but the scalper or the black marketer opposite at the Panwala Dukan was selling it for four times the price. Those were the rules of the game. If you wanted a cricket ticket, you would go stand in line with a bamboo scaffolding on Marine Drive overnight to reach the box office, get lati charged by the cops as a customer, and then to be told no tickets are available, and the black marketeers would sell it. It's like going to Starbucks today and saying, hey, listen, I want a cup of coffee. You're giving him the money, and the guy whacks you on your hand. I mean, that's how consumers were treated, right? It was just bizarre. So there's a structural hole that needed to be filled, and it was a problem to be solved. That's why the business was born. And that's why it will continue to make money. Most businesses today are, listen, there's an investor. I can make an ass out of the guy. There's money floating around, cheap capital. Let me try and do this and see if I can sell a business in three years. It'll never make money. Because you've got to continue to bribe and throw money to get your customer. First time user, recency frequency, uh, maintaining that customer loyalty. You've got to keep throwing cash at that customer. This is on a very, very weak footing. Till about five years back, everybody said, hey, Ashish, you're talking bullshit, right? You're, you're smoking something. I do, but not all the time. And they're like, you know, you're, you're smoking something. How can you even talk like that? Just look at the last two or three years. There have been at least 100, 150 internet companies that have died. Some of them with valuations of over $5 billion or $6 billion today are not even worth $300 million. So just look at history and you will realize, just like the stock market, don't get too excited. Good times and bad times will keep ebbing and flowing. Having said that, 2007 is when the market turned again. And between 2002 to 2007, what did Book My Show do? We looked at the first principles of business. If I made money, I paid salaries. If I earned money, I switched on my lights. And I'm not kidding. If in summer I kept my air conditioners off uh, because I couldn't afford it, I still recall we couldn't afford the STD uh, monthly charge. It was some 300 bucks at that time. And so I would go in Bandra, which was a 136 square foot office. We used to be in Prabhadevi before that. Uh, my friends from advertising had helped me get Prabhadevi Industrial Estate. And then in Bandra, I would go to these STD booth and make calls to clients in Delhi. And 
when I made those calls, there was a lot of road noise, right? So they would say, why is it so noisy? And you know, I'd say, listen, we're really busy. We've got a lot of action. Kutte bhok rahe office mein. There was nobody, man. We were six of us really looking for business. But you know, those are fun days because it taught us the first principles of business. Even today, those are lessons that we as a company don't forget. It's that boiling frog theory, right? If you let the water boil slowly and put a frog, he doesn't realize and he'll die. You throw the frog in really hot water, he's gonna jump out. And so it's these little things that creep into your business which will allow you not to make money. This is a 30,000 view that I'm giving you. More companies in the internet world die out of indigestion than starvation. And the reason is because there is so much cheap capital available that they just don't do right by the customer. They never think of the user or the customer. They're like, listen, I'm just gonna buy this customer. And good for us, let the Americans, the Chinese, uh, the Japanese, now the South Africans pour money into the country. It's created a new middle class based on all of this capital. But is it gonna sustain a real business? Only time will tell. So 2002 to 2007, as we built this pipe, we ran a really frugal ship. Even today, we fly low cost carriers. We don't have secretaries booking our tickets. We reuse envelopes, we reuse pins. We serve shit coffee in our offices, but if you want bean to cup, uh, Italian coffee, you pay 20 bucks on an honor system and you can get it, but otherwise you get really cheap coffee. Uh, we stay in reasonable hotels. But we lead rich lives, uh, maybe not you know, expensive lives. Uh, and we are very, very altruistic. And I'll come to the altruism bit in a bit, but as far as the business is concerned, uh, we don't talk about most of it in, in public domain. So most guys say, listen, are you a unicorn? And I tell them, what is a unicorn? I mean, it's an ugly animal with a horn, uh, and it doesn't exist. But they're saying, kuch to bolo, koi to animal ho gaya. You know, if you're not a unicorn, some animal, I'm saying, I'm a mongrel, I'm a dog. I wake up every day, there's a fight out there as an entrepreneur. If somebody pets you, no problem. Somebody gives you food, eat. There's a pack of dogs, run. There will always be another day to pick a fight. And, you know, if that's the way you look at it, and they're like, like this is not a good animal. You have to be another animal. And I tell them I'm a cockroach. I've survived for 19 years, either in a nuclear holocaust or a microwave oven. These analogies, and now I've heard the latest one. It's not unicorns, but sunicorns. Guys who are soon to become unicorns. Why should it even matter what your valuation is? Is your NPS high? Book my show's NPS went from 31 to 62 in the last three years. Is your customer happy? What is your recency frequency? What is your lifetime value of the customer? What do you spend on your CPC, cost per customer contact? What do you spend on CPA, acquiring a customer? How big is it? How loyal are they? I think these are some of the metrics that really matter. But some metrics which you may sort of want to listen to, Book My Show today is present in 660 cities and towns. We are 1,600 employees. Uh, too many, I think, but anyways, we're 1,600 employees. Uh, Book My Show sells about 14 million tickets a month. We get about 128 million visits, we do 2.5 billion page views, uh, we have about 75 million subs, we do 35 million MAUs, and we have many, many, many ever bots. That's the scale of the company today. But we're still under the radar, we still do what we do, we wake up every day, look at the consumer and say, how do you solve a new problem? And then we looked at the business and we said, look, are, is the market growing fast? And Everybody talks about this middle class and India as a 1.2 or 1.3 billion people market. It's not, we're bullshitting ourselves. We are many countries. The language, the food, the state, everything changes. And how even the socio-economic class, we are the same Indians who look away from a slum and want the maid to come seven times a week uh, like bonded labor and smile in the morning to serve your kids while they leave their kids at home. And we are saying there is no other India. It's SECA, it's urban markets, it's bullshit, right? There are so many Indias even within a microchasm or just around us. And how are you solving that problem or catering to that individual? And so as far as we are concerned, we said there is no bottom feeder market as far as we are concerned. Let's look at the top of the market. So we looked at the top of the funnel and we said, how many Indians can we cater to? There are 10% of this country, unfortunately, it's a very, very poor metric, 10% of this country controls about 40 or 43% of the wealth. The bottom 5% of this country uh, controls, uh, the, the bottom 40% uh, uh, of this country controls only 5% of the wealth. 
And then there is this emerging middle class whose definition nobody knows. We, we are very, very optimistic people. So everybody has a new definition of this middle class. So how do you actually make money with this middle class? For me, the middle class, what I see is your driver who used to get paid six, 7,000 bucks today will walk out on you if you don't pay him 18,000 bucks because he has a mobile handset in his hand and he can get a job at Uber and Ola. I'm extremely happy for this, this group of people. But this, to my mind, is a big sea change because they're spending better money on healthcare, on putting their kids to better, he doesn't want his kid to be a, a driver, so better education and better food on the table. And I think this is where we've got to cater all our strength and energy and effort into. So the view that we take of the world is the top seven markets is where we get all our business from. We are now focusing on the next 28 and the next 60, even though we're present in 650 cities and towns. That's one view that you take. That can you do something better? Do you get to newer cinemas? Are we present in as many cinemas? Are we making our proposition more valuable for the person without giving cashbacks and discounts? Of course we give cashbacks and discounts for new users, lock them down. See if you can get a new user. Can you do recency and frequency? Can you create a base of superstars, which is your loyal customers, which is about 15% of your customers giving you 60, 70% of your revenue? And while retaining that base, can you still get to the new users? And of course, keeping your costs low. We still scrape the bottom of the barrel by having black and white printers in our office. I mean, we're still an invested company, which is still growing at about 50, 60% year on year. Uh, it slowed down, we used to grow at 200%, but we're still growing at 50, 60% at this scale. Having said that, I think the other way to look at it is, can you go a little more horizontal? Because in India, it's very difficult to reach that customer base that quickly, because there's regional languages, there's a socioeconomic challenge, and there is also the problem of connectivity. Geo has added 170 million subs in the last one year, but up until then, the number of subs that were there in the country itself was not very large. This number will end up at about 450, 500 million over the next maybe two years. And then on top of that, you've got to have an intersection of does this person have a credit card? Do they have a debit card? Do they have net banking? Uh, you've seen WhatsApp's new integration on, on uh, payments. Uh, I'm really loving sending one one rupee to people and getting one buck back. It's just unbelievable, the user experience, the peer-to-peer. -peer. So we were the first partners of WhatsApp in India for uh, list, whitelisting our services, and now they've started uh, payments. We're probably going to be the first there. So I think as you solve for these problems, the penetration will take time. We're certainly at the cusp over the next five or 10 years. And then you will need to just wait it out and just stay the course for a long period of time. The other thing that we've actually done is slightly go, go slightly horizontal. The metric we looked at and said, look, we have a frictionless transaction. And why should we create more friction? I don't know if you guys have realized in 19 years, Book My Show has never asked you for your email ID, mobile number, asked you to register, what's your name, your mother's name, your father's name, what's your gender, uh, how many times you go out to eat. No questions, no F connect. Only the time when you want to buy a ticket, we ask you for your email ID and mobile number. And that for me is the only metric that I need or the only piece of information that I need to know who you are, where you stay, where you watch a movie, what concerts you go for, do you buy kids' movies? Do you buy adult content? Do you buy family content? Do you go for concerts, venues? I don't need to know anything else. We drop a cookie, we analyze your data through that. We don't ask you for more data because it creates friction. It's again like going to Starbucks and saying, hey, listen, I want a cup of coffee. And then they ask you a bunch of questions before they serve you coffee. It's pretty annoying, isn't it? So as we look at the, looked at the business and we said, we are catering to a frictionless transaction which is 2.8 minutes per session. Can we increase this for our consumers without creating friction? And therefore, very subtly, within making a hue and cry, we added a piece called ratings. So Book My Show has a differential weighted average system for people who have actually bought a movie ticket or a concert ticket. And we asked you to rate that film, and it's the most authentic rating, and you get a very, very different weighted average. And then we have consumers who use their login and then say, I want to watch this movie, or I want to go for this concert, or I don't want to go for this concert. And then you have the last set of customers who just wants to come and vote. And then you have the critics, who we give a very, very low weighted average in the Book My Show system, which gives you the most authentic and valuable rating system that we have built within Book My Show. It's giving us a lot of recency frequency, and it's giving us a lot of time spent on, on, the, on the application. 
The other thing that we did was, when people come, they just want more information about actors, actresses, they want to know a little bit more about directors. And we added an IMDB equivalent called IEDB, again, without naming it anything, within Book My Show, and we've got 60,000 profiles, again, to increase engagement of people coming on the site and coming more often. We used to get people once a month. We made it uh, once a fortnight. We made it once a week. And now our metric is three times a week and 6.9 minutes per session. Then we looked at this problem and said, you know, this SEC, we're very good with the SEC A and B, 32 plus. Can we cater to the 24 to 32? Can we cater to the 18 to 24? And can we go to B and C? So we said, you know what? Maybe music is the conduit to getting to these people. And therefore, Book My Show launched a jukebox, which is within the app. And what we've done over there is increased our recency, frequency, and time spent. And getting to newer audiences who probably don't have a debit card, don't have a credit card, but maybe have a geo connection on 303 bucks, one GB of data a day, and they just want to listen to music. And so it's not a playlist. It's just a streaming app. And what it's giving us, we've got a data science team, which is sitting there and analyzing this data and saying, when you increase the volume of Kygo, I now know that you like Kygo or similar genres of music or similar artists. And so now with that, I know, can I get that live event into the market? I don't know how many Bob Dylan fans, maybe all of you are Bob Dylan fans, looking at the age profile here, or CCR, or Jefferson Airplane. But I want to know how many Kings of Leon fans do you have in Delhi? And can I get Kings of Leon to India? And so when we looked at 18 years of data, we said, let's build a live division. So we just finished Ed Sheeran. We did AR Rahman, a uh, four-city tour. We're in the middle of an Arjit Singh 10-city tour. We've signed Cirque du Soleil for five years. Shh, don't tell anyone. Cirque du Soleil for five years in India. With the producers for Disney, we're doing Aladdin, and we're getting Disney on Ice, uh, Peppa Pig, and Chota Beam. We're just going after the kids category again, everything which is 18 to 24, and can be catered to the 24 to 32. So this live division, given the data that we have, given the digital reach that we have, given the music reach, and everything that we're doing, the superstar program, the recency frequency, and first time users, is looking to see how much can we stretch the dollar in the top seven, the next 60, and the rest of the market. So businesses are built by solving these real problems, about thinking deeply about how you can better yourself and looking inward. It's not about going and seeing if I can eat somebody else's lunch. The easiest way in India to build a digital business without actually going through the fuss is taking a 50 rupee note, getting some investor money, standing outside the gate of ITC, and start handing out 50 rupee notes. You'll have 2 million customers by the, by the time this night ends. That's not the way you actually build a loyal customer base. And before I end, I think it's very, very close to our heart, is the altruism. In India, we can solve so many problems. It's just not the problem in terms of valuation, profits, and revenue that you can solve for yourself. I looked around us, and I said, what are we doing? Are we doing right by the people that work for us and the people that we cater to? So Book My Show turned around and said, look, we give a CTC to 1,600 employees. We turned around and said, let's give medical care to everybody. No copay, funded by the company. And now this comes to the heart of the problem. Even though we scrape the bottom of the barrel, do we make money in e-commerce? Or we don't make money. If there's competition, sometimes our 20 crore budget annually on advertising sometimes jumps to 20 crores a month. And we can blow up 100, 120 crores in the blink of an eyelid. But in spite of that, we run a medical program in the company, which is yourself, one spouse, if you have two tucked away, your problem, two kids, and a set of parents. So we pay up and down, not just up or down. We also started a pure term life plan from two years ago. Then three years ago, I asked the guy serving me in the office, and I said, look, um, you know, what do you eat? And he said, I eat uh, 20 rupees worth of food. And I said, what do you mean? So he says, my diet is defined by 20 bucks. It's six bananas, or two vada pavs, or bhajia. And I said, how is it even right? So I played Robin Hood, and we started a food program in the company without impacting the bottom line, or the PNL. So we get a meal for 75 bucks, but we get everybody in the company to pay 125 rupees for that meal. And anybody whose salary is below 30,000 a month, which could be an outsourced staff, a janitor, a security guard, your office boys, anybody, they get the meal for 20 bucks, which is what they would normally pay for, which is playing Robin Hood. I'm not a religious person. 
I've never been to a temple except for archaeological reasons. I find it bizarre when on Mahashivratri people are pouring one liter of milk on Shiva's ling when there's a poor child outside. Having said that, we started uh, uh, something in the company where we said, look, I'm not religious, but the Gita actually talks about Krishna's discourse to Arjun on the battlefield. Basically, Krishna was a cheat. He kept the sun up. He told Karuna, Arjun, the weak spot of Karuna. And basically, the lesson to be learned over there, the end is important, not the means. So most of you who are consumers of Book My Show, I'm assuming most of, a lot of you are, when you buy a ticket on Book My Show, uh, we skim all of you, which basically cheat you, of one rupee a ticket. And I could have made it an opt-in, but from my advertising days, I realized that there's a key which most advertisers put, which is Times New Roman 6 font or 8 font or something. So this whole one rupee, which is an opt-out instead of an opt-in, is Times New Roman 8 or 6. So you don't even miss it. You, you miss it. 70% of our customers actually miss it. We're collecting 1111 rupee, and we collect 10 crores a year from you guys and build great karma for a lot of you. We, sell the double we sent the double amputee kids to the Pan Am Games who won the silver medal. We support the Jharkhand girls in soccer, 300 of them annually, which is Yuva, and six of them went to play at the Royal Sociedad, a UEFA one-level coaching, along with Real Madrid, and they went to meet 60,000 fans. Uh, we call kids from orphanages and cancer society to a movie. Every time a movie releases, without any PR or fanfare, get an actor at that time, because they're like mushrooms. They come to you only when their movie releases and make them feel really shit if they don't come there, and pay for the popcorn, coke, and get the actor to talk to those kids. And then when you have an ISL game, an IPL, which is now around the corner, we take one day with our teams and get all the janitorial and, sec and the security staff and replace them by paying for their salary for that one day and get them to watch a game and give them food for that day and get them to watch the game because otherwise they're just cleaning toilets. And I think if we as business leaders and as, as media people don't do this, and if we don't draw from society, create value for ourselves and give back. It doesn't matter if we're profitable or we're loss making, we're definitely at a loss for life. Thank you very much. Well, I think that deserves another round of applause there, ladies and gentlemen. What a man of fashion and the kind of entrepreneurial zeal there. Thank you so much indeed for joining us. I'm going to invite Lara Balsara, who's the Executive Director with Madison World, to please come on stage and present a token of gratitude to Mr. Ashish Hemrajani. What a great presentation indeed. I totally agree. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you once again.